I want you to make, help make my death a festival, like the ones we created long ago, my friend Julian said, his smile making the large tumor on the side of his face easier for me to bear. He wanted laughter as well as tears, shared love and meaning, like the rituals we'd celebrated as young parents. Dancing at May Day, blessing his wife Lori's pregnancy at Candlemas, these were life's marvelous little gateways. Now we were standing at a much more challenging threshold. Julian was courageously choosing to end his life, a death with dignity. And through a wonder synchronicity, after 18 years of our not seeing each other, when he and Laurie contacted a sacred moment funeral services looking for a home funeral guide, I was there to answer the call. It is daunting at times to be a deaf midwife and a newly licensed funeral director when most of my friends are retiring. <laughs> Yet, my ministry has always been to help others celebrate life's passages. And I'm committed to bringing nature and balance back into everything we do as human beings. It makes sense that I would turn my attention now to the end of life and the healing and the environmental awareness still needed at that threshold. Nature has always been a teacher for me, an ally, a friend. I come from a big southern clan who all love and care for the environment in different ways. I am the daughter who took mama literally when she woke us up as children and asked if we had danced with the fairies in the night. While my siblings are saving maritime forests and public lands, and my daughter Eliza is developing fungal products for climate change, I, I make offerings to hidden springs and try to contact local spirits of land and place. For me, there are always voices in the wind stories in starlight, songs in rushing streams, living elemental consciousness within nature, trying to reach us, we human beings who have lost our way. When I was in my early 20s, a book literally fell off a shelf and knocked me on the head, <laughs> truly, in the stacks of a university library. It was the Finhorn Garden about a spiritual community in the north of Scotland where people were working with nature intelligence to address spiritual and ecological crises of our time. I remember sliding down to the floor of the stacks, my hands trembling, my heart recognizing, even before I opened the book's pages, that I had found people on the planet like me, people who see the earth as a living being, as a self-regulating organism, Gaia, calling to humanity to wake up and reclaim our steps in life's dance. I feel that call as a clear inner directive, one that has shaped most of my adult life decisions and continues to ask me to live from the inside out as hard as that has been at times. I did go to Finhorn after the book, and there I found a brochure about the Chinook Learning Center on Whidbey Island. <laughs> that was part of the guidance. <clears throat> Some of the bro people on the, that brochure are my dearest friends today, yet I carried them around for 10 years before I ever arrived here on the island. That was 1988. I was a single mother struggling after a painful divorce. I found new inspiration and healing by immersing myself in the land and the community at Chinook, now called the Whidbey Institute, and the Waldorf School nearby. I saw how hungry people were for new rituals and ceremony 
for spiritual nourishment not tied to any one church or organized religion. So I began crafting seasonal festivals and classes for parents and children in my women's circles. We delighted in discovering that no matter how individual our stories or how different our spiritual paths, our shared experience of nature in a particular season in our bodies, in our souls, was a shared wonder. This wove us together and created rich and supportive communities. Some of those women are still gathering today. And the children who celebrated festivals with me and seasonal poetry and plays have an abiding love for art and nature and one another. This makes me very happy. <laughs> and oh, what fun we had. The celebrations were always child-centered. And so they were full of real magic and joy. Also shared sorrow and support in times of need. Whatever threshold of change we found ourselves facing, ritual often helped us to embrace what was happening, to shed what we no longer needed, and to find fresh landscapes of awareness together. The crossing between life and death, though, is still the hardest for most of us to navigate. It's only human to feel shock and fear and denial when that doorway opens. Yet our current funeral practices do little to ease our way and often leave a deep carbon footprint not sustainable for our future. With simple green burial, where only biodegradable materials are placed in the earth again. And home funeral vigils, or wakes, where we care for our loved ones, our own dead at home, as we once did. We're reclaiming more natural and nourishing and sustainable death practices. You can see from these photos the gifts of beauty and hope and the ability to truly grieve when we creatively participate in our loved one's care, rather than entrusting that sacred task to strangers. Though these choices are not for everyone, they are an important consciousness-raising endeavor, and they offer wonderful opportunities for families and communities to reimagine together what is possible at the end of life. I return now to Julian and Laurie's story, for they did consciously reimagine and embrace death. And in so doing, they became sacred teachers for us all. I'll never forget Julian holding court in his living room, asking with so much intention and care who would carry his body downstairs after death for the three-day vigil who would help me with his wound care and dry ice? Who would provide sustenance for all the people coming and watch over his wife and children? After Julian died, he lay in state in his meditation room, looking for all the world like King Arthur on his beer. People gathered round all the children from his neighborhood poetry writing classes crafted farewell verses, tucked them in his pockets and reverently at his feet. Others painted his cremation container with bright colors. We rented an electric blue van, jazz pouring from the loudspeakers, smiley face balloons dancing in the back. And we transported our king to the crematorium in a loving procession of family and friends. Julian's Festival. I have said yes to being a gatekeeper. Yes to blessing potent passages in people's lives. I know now that every moment is a threshold. An invitation for us to open to our essential wholeness, our true natures, and to feel 
no matter what happens to us, that transformation and healing and celebration are always possible. And we really can, as Julian did, make of our lives and our deaths great festivals of love.